Making sure. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started with our lightning talks today. So this is the last session for today. We do have the reception coming up after that. It will be at 6.30 in Mosaic, which is just kind of across the way. So if you go back out of the hotel parking lot, take a right, it's down there on the left. Um, but we're going to go in the order of the program. So first up is Monet Lewis Timmons uh, with Processing the Papers of J.J. Phillips, Donor Relations and Archival Possibilities. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'm actually going to take a seat so folks on Zoom can see me and also so I can read um, from my computer. But thanks everybody for being here. This is great. Um, I do want to preface my paper by just saying that um, this is more of a, a reflective piece um, on my own time processing the collection. And so I'm happy for any feedback, suggestions, um, comments, all of that good stuff. In the fall of 2021, I had the opportunity to intern at Emory University's Stuart A. Rose Manuscript, Archives, and Rare Book Library. The Rose Library was where I was introduced to archives as an undergraduate, and because I wanted to gain more experience in processing and arranging collections, I thought it was important to learn from the archivists and librarians who inspired me. I worked closely with Gabrielle Dudley, former institution archivist and now head of research services, and Sarah Quigley, former head of manuscript processing, to process the personal and family papers of Black woman writer J.J. Phillips. Born 1944 in Los Angeles, California, Jane Julia Phillips is a poet, novelist, editor, and archivist. She published her first novel, Mojo Han, in 1966, and was editor and writer for the Bay Area Multicultural Literary Magazine before Columbus Review. She published her second novel, The Passion of Joan Paul II, in 1996. Since then, Phillips has spent her time building her own archive as she reflects on her own family history through writing and research, and she currently resides in Berkeley, California. When I, first present, when I was first presented with the opportunity to process Phillips' papers, I was excited yet nervous, since this was my first time arranging and describing another person's papers. I had always been on the other side of the reading room as a researcher, but now I have a chance to be an archivist and could use this position to help other users of collections. Purchased back in 2003, the Phillips family papers include correspondence, photographs, manuscript drafts, programs, and illustrations. The collection details Phillips' career as a writer in addition to her family's history dating back to the 1860s. I divided the collection into two series, Series 1, J.J. Phillips Papers, 1944 to 2002, and Series 2, Phillips Family Papers, 1867 to 1988. Doing so allowed me to communicate to researchers the plethora of material that goes beyond Phillips' own writing career. On my first day sitting with the collection, I was surprised how organized the materials were. As a former archivist at UC Berkeley's Bancroft Library, Phillips had already arranged and filed her papers using folders and titles for each section, which I knew was rare for unprocessed collections. Phillips' own collecting and archival practice made it easier for me to not only arrange and describe her papers, but it also helped me learn more about her life while giving me an idea of how she wanted her collection to reflect her writing and family history. Because I was not familiar with her work beforehand, I took my time going through each folder and document. When arranging the materials, I was sure to keep as close to Philip's original order as possible to honor her labor and respect how she wanted to be represented. As I enjoyed the process of arranging and describing Philip's papers, I constantly asked myself, how would JJ feel about this? Is this how she would want to be remembered through her archive? I spoke more with Gabrielle and Sarah about contacting Philip's. And although they did not have her updated contact information, they both encouraged me to reach out if possible. Because Phillips has been out of the public eye for so long, it was difficult finding any current contact information. Yet, after some perusing online, I found a Medium blog post written by her titled, Unearthing the Past, Part 1, Monroe, North Carolina, Summer 1962, published on Medium, June 26, 2021. There, Phillips describes a tragic experience of herself and a young white woman being car chased by Klan members 
as two young black men protected them. This was during her time participating in voter registration and the lunch counter sit-ins during the civil rights era. While the post is reflective of the horror and terror Phillips faced, her main goal of the essay is to actually find the two men who protected her that night so she can thank them. As I read the details of this essay, I realized that there was already a copy of this same story in her archive, which allowed me to confirm that this was JJ Phillips. She used a different handle when she published it, so it was very unclear, like, is this her, is it not, you know. I decided to email the posted address, introducing myself and explaining to Phillips that I wanted to speak more with her about her work and have her input on the finding aid before publishing the final version. I grew nervous waiting for her response, thinking, what if she doesn't respond? What if she has no interest in reliving and retelling her life? I knew these were all possibilities and prepared myself for no response. But a few weeks later, I heard back from Phillips and she was excited and grateful that I was the one working on her papers. From there, we began corresponding over several months and had phone conversations where she provided me with missing pieces to include in the description and gave me advice on what it means to be a black woman working in archives. Phillips opened up to me about her experiences with racism and sexism, mental health, and the difficulties of publishing as a black woman writer. Because of our established relationship and trust, she used our conversations as a space to authentically express herself, grateful that someone was taking the time to listen to her story. She would often say that, quote, it is of utmost importance that the facts of my life and background and book be clearly stated and documented so I can be seen and judged for good and ill as I am, not as others need me to be. Philip's awareness on the importance of her archive encouraged me to reimagine the possibilities of processing archives. My particular experience in project complicates the quote, traditional donor and archivist relationship, which sometimes does not include or consider the voice and input of donors once institutions acquire the collections. I'm curious about what it means for black women to curate and control their own narratives through personal archive building. As scholars and archivists shifting our attention to the labor behind building one's archive, this opens up more conversations and questions on how we can honor this work in finding aids and descriptions, ultimately presenting researchers and users with a better idea of how these collections came to be. This project also reveals the importance of Black women processing other Black women's papers as an act of care and a way of honoring those that came before us. This act of collecting and memorializing is a practice that exists outside of institutional repositories. I'm sure for many of us, we can remember our grandmothers and aunties creating photo albums, quilting, and even writing down recipes as a form of memory keeping and making. We see the same practice and bond, and bond formed between Black women archivists and Black women, Black women donors slash archive creators. Creating space for these conversations and relationships to develop reframes the archival profession as it encourages us to consider the labor of creators so that we can better spotlight the collections. While I am aware that there are exceptions to this approach and not all don donors are easy to work with, I'm curious about what this will look like and mean for future acquisitions and what are some of the possibilities in working with Black women donors and their papers. Thank you. And we're going to switch it up just a little bit, and before you start, I'm going to turn off the camera, and then we can share the screen. All right, so while um, he gets set up, go ahead. Okay. Next up is Hector Montford with Preserving Local History with the Help of Undergraduate Research. So used to Google Slides. Hang on one second. Are you presenting? Yeah, there's, there's a button in the bottom. Ah, there's sound there now. Okay. Yeah. All right. There we go. I've done the same thing. There you go. Excellent. All right. All right. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Hector Monkford, and I'm a professor at the College of Coastal Georgia, which is located in Brunswick, not too far from here. And what I wanted to do today, and quickly, uh, is to share with you guys uh, some of my, my students' efforts to preserve and uh, uh, preserve and to uh, promote local history uh, in the region. And I want to quickly, I want to do two things. I want to talk about what we've done in the community 
and also kind of share with you the experiences of, of my undergraduate students. Um, we have an American Studies degree and an Interdisciplinary Studies degree, and I'm pulling students from there to, to get them more involved in local history and in actual, actually practicing history outside of the classroom. So that's what this quick story is all about. Um, so I'll start with the projects. And we've done several over time, but I wanted to focus on two. Uh, they both pertain to Risley High School, which if you guys are familiar, or you're probably not with Brunswick. Uh, Risley was the segregated high school in the community for decades. Uh, it has its roots in the reconstruction era, and it finally closed its doors as the segregated high school in 1970, whenever the county finally fully integrated. Uh, and what we wanted to do is capture the memories of the students who went there, the faculty who taught there. And that's what these two projects kind of encompass. So the two projects, the first was an oral history project with former Risley students and faculty, where we talked about their time at the high school. And we also picked their brains about living in Brunswick, uh, their lives in the 1950s and the 1960s. And a lot of those faculty members especially were active in the local civil rights movement. So we talked to them about that as well. So that was the first part. Uh, the second part was a digitization project that we worked with uh, with the Grizzly uh, Alumni Association, where they have all of these photographs from in these albums and they're slowly deteriorating over time. And what we wanted to do was to digitize those albums, not just to preserve them because, you know, keep them in their current state, but to also be able to share them with other people. And I'll talk about the oral history project first. So we started that in the summer of 2020, which as you guys probably are aware, was a pretty hectic summer. Um, an oral history project during COVID, probably not the best idea, um, but we tried it anyway. The class was online, it was an oral history class. And the way we set up the actual interviews was that we used the Marshall of Glenn Library, uh, the downtown Brunswick Library, and we had a large, spacious room. We brought each interviewee in that way. I was in the room with them. We were masked up, as you can see right here with Mr. Wade. He was masked up most of the time. Um, <laughs> masked up. Uh, I was masked up. We had uh, hand sanitizer, recording equipment. I sat about 20 feet away in the room. And if you listen to these interviews, it sounds like I'm yelling at these people. <laughs> but I'm not, I promise. I'm just talking as loud as I can so they can hear me. Um, and I had my students from the class, I didn't want them to be exposed, so they zoomed in um, virtually. And so they asked their questions through the computer, that's why the speakers there, the laptops there as well, so that they could have their conversations that way. And we conducted uh, about seven or eight of these interviews all together, and overall, except for the technical glitches you are probably accustomed to with the Zoom conference call, they went very well. We got some really important information. These, these, these folks were happy to share information with us um, and they didn't hold back sometimes their experiences. So, so we have really good information, really good, we preserved memory of this event, of these events of Risley, of the time period. And we've also made sources available now thanks to this. On the other side of the spectrum, we had the digitization project. And I, I have a picture here of my quote unquote public history lab on campus. It's just a classroom I squatted in, basically. <laughs> so they gave it to me um, where we had our setup. We were going to scan these photographs, but we had a problem. The photographs were in albums, huge albums, um, and they were homemade photo albums. They were made with uh, plywood, with metal fasteners, and they were huge. They're beautiful. They made them in the wood shop at Risley, um, but that for a person who wants to preserve something, scan something, a real pain. So what we had to do was, you know, we took them onto campus and we were gonna scan them and realize our, our typical scanner was not gonna work. Um, we had to do some creative thinking and we took a digital camera and a mount, put the camera straight down and then slid these different images or different pages underneath, taking an image of one photograph at a time. Um, and it worked, it worked really well. So you see how these photographs are deteriorating, right? These are, you know, time and glue and all those things are destroying these photographs. But through our efforts, we were able to preserve these photos as best we can, at least in their current state. And we have photographs from Risley, the students. We have photographs from Risley faculty 
we have uh, PTA records from Risley. I'll talk about the Black PTA in this community, which I think is an important resource for, for researchers. And those are now not just digitized for them to have, but also we put them online to make them more available, not just to the general public here, because we want to tell the story more about this here, but also to make it available for researchers elsewhere who may be interested in African American seg in segregation in the South during the 1950s and 1960s. And so, how am I doing like that? One minute. One minute. All right. Um, <laughs> That's the story of the projects. But I wanted to do the, the final slide here is talk about the value of this. The value to our students and the value to our community. The organizations that we work for, the uh, Brunswick African American Cultural Center, which is who we did the oral histories for, uh, the Risley Alumni Association, which we did the digitization for, they don't necessarily have the resources to do this themselves. Uh, a lot of them are older. Um, unfamiliar with technology, they don't have the financial resources. So we were able to take some of that burden for them and, and to help them with that. And we did this all on their behalf. It's not our college's property, it's their records. We just did this for them. Um, at the same time, my students learned all kinds of public history skills, skills like uh, interviewing skills, uh, experience with digital preservation and, and, and digital um, uh, controlling digital projects and our products and things of that nature and practicing history outside of the classroom. So they're gaining practical experience using history besides just, you know, reading a textbook, taking the test. And they're also getting skills that are transferable, which is the key for, you know, professors, transferable skills outside of history that they can use, uh, hopefully looking for jobs at some other point. So that was a really fast, quick <laughs> version of that. How did I do? Was I too bad? Hold on, let's see. out. Okay. <laughs> I kept going at a slower pace. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Not too bad for me. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. So next up is the power of consortium in the archival community. Uh, by Linda Collette. Hi, everybody. Yep. Okay. I forgot to ask you how to do it. Sure, you did it perfectly. Yeah. There you go. Do you have a slideshow for here? Um, I do have a slideshow for here. And I'm okay. also going to sit down so that I can kind of go back and forth. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. All right. Let me get this going first. Oh, how do I turn that off? It shows up different on the screen. So this is oh, it just does? presenter oh, Perfect. Yeah. Oh, all right. Okay, so hello, my name is Linda Collette. I'm the senior outreach strategist for Collection Space. Um, it's a division of Lyricis, and several of you are familiar with Lyricis. The theme for this year's SGA meeting is sustaining archives, practical solutions for the future. So connected to this theme is how the power of consortia can help do that forming partnerships with like-minded archives and sharing online access tools can bring together our collective insights. So we at Collection Space provide open source technology to help archives manage their collections. We provide an open source collections management tool called Collection Space, which can be used just by one collection or it can be used by several collections through a shared web portal. The more consortia members come on board, the price for everyone goes down. So it's all about sharing costs, sharing resources, and sharing collections. I'm trying to get used to my new back and forth. So, so um, I figured I would start first with to tell you what collection space is about because I'll be connecting that with the theme of the power of consortia. So CollectionSpace is a web-based open source collections information management system. It's in daily use at a variety of archives, libraries, and museums, from cataloging and loans to inventory and digital asset management. It's used to manage many of the day-to-day -day activities of collecting professionals, whether you work in archives, libraries, or museums. So our goal is we strive to be the leading open source collections management system in the academic community of archives, libraries, and museums with collections to manage. 
And um, we are part of Lyricis, which is about 100 people strong. It's a nonprofit that supports other nonprofits. Um, and Lyricis has probably close to 10 different open source systems. We host a lot of systems as well, uh, such as Archive Space. Many people host Archive Space, we're not the only ones, but we are the only ones that have developed collection space. And um, so our strength is in our community, our support from Lyricis and all the services that it offers. Lyricis is like a big think tank with classes and consultation and services. So we are part of that. Um, we create systems where your data is highly standardized and secure and data is always available to other software via an API. And we could work with you and other service providers to understand how to set up those relationships. So just to kind of give you a little look and feel of what collection space is, here's a screenshot of our standard cataloging screen. Archival collections we work with include materials such as manuscripts, letters, photographs, moving images and sound materials, artworks, books, um, books, diaries, artifacts, and the digital equivalents of all those things. So sometimes we need to care for these as collection objects and track the provenance, whether it's been loaned out and keeping track of location and history. So um, we also provide a public access portal to the front end of the system. And this is the shared portal that our consortium groups use to search on their collections together. So I wanted to throw this in. This is actually some wise words from Howard Besser from the University of Berkeley from 2004, but it's still very relevant. So be before I launch into a consortia talk, I wanna take a moment to say a quick word about LAMS. Uh, the functional distinctions still remain, even though technology changes blur the formally sharp distinctions between libraries, museums, and archives in an online environment. And I'm actually going to skip over some of these details because I'm not sure what my timing is going to be. Um, but um, I'm hoping that my um, presentation will be shared and you guys can take a look at this. Um, that all being said, let's talk about how technology-driven consortia can help us all collaborate. So forming consortia of like-minded archival institutions can provide practical solutions. It can sustain our best practices as well as provide affordable tech solutions where we can share costs. But this is not a new concept, right? Let's talk about who's doing this very well. So the Society of American Archivists developed a guide that identifies archival collections that are held in a given repository in a consortium. Um, collections concerned with the history and culture of a geographical area. So these consortia offer pooled resources and economies of scale that allow discoverability of smaller libraries, museums, and archives. And then there is the um, University Archives and Special Collections from La Jolla. They have a Catholic Research Resource Alliance, which provides global freely available access to very rare and unique and uncommon materials about Catholicism in libraries, seminaries, special collections, and archi archives. And although I'm not a Catholic, I am an art history teacher, and I'm always lacking in my ability to explain what medieval art is about. So I would be someone who would be tapping into that. The Black Metropolis Research Consortium through consortia programs, uh, they aid in expanding broad access to its members' holdings of materials that document African-American and African culture, history, and politics. And then the Chicago Collections, which back in the spring produced a digital exhibit um, which focused on highlighting the important role cultural heritage collections play in urban communities. I'm gonna skip over this one for now and jump to this one. This is a uh, consortia that we do with collection space. So collection space, although we service archives, libraries, museums one-on-one, -on -one, we also build consortia models. Um, where you're using technology to bridge together your collections. Material order is one of our consortia models where we had um, the list of these um, institutions. I'm not sure if you can see them, but it's Harvard, Columbia, 
OCAD University, RISD, University of Connecticut, University of Michigan, and OCAD University will be joining us soon. And this is a group of art and design libraries that are using our portal as a way to share information about their, um, their programs. And it's for scholars and for faculty as well. And um, it's actually been very successful and they kind of exist on their own. They just use us, they're powered by collection space, but the consortium models itself. Um, so when it gets to 10 consortium members, they will have free access to the shared portal because we will hit our sustainability mark for that. Um, so the audience that the material order speaks to is two sides. And I, I bring this up because certainly when you're doing a technological consortia, these are things you have to think of. Who's your internal audience, which may be if you're on in a university, graduate students and faculty, and then the external audience, such as outside researchers and other archival um, colleagues uh, and practitioners and librarians, vendors, manufacturers. So this brings me to what do we have to think about when, like why is do, doing consortia with technology important? Well, when we think about sustaining and caring for our archival collections, it's always gonna be on that list for us. When we think about how to maintain our collections, we have to keep metrics of approximately, because we never quite know what's in all our boxes, the percent of what's been accession, cataloged, inventory, visually documented, in need of conservation, and what's available online. And to sustain and care for your archival collections online, we need technology tools available for tracking collections care and materials. We need to have condition, conservation, provenance, inventory, what's been loaned in and loaned out, vocabulary metadata to describe our materials. Hopefully I'm not overwhelming you with all the responsibility, but that's why we wanna share our archival collections amongst our fellow archivists. And this is why consortia technology tools are so important. So to sustain and care for your archival collections online, you need to think about, you don't need to, but it's useful to think about consortia tools because this way you can have shared technology costs, costs amongst consortium members. You can have shared vocabulary metadata that becomes standardized across like-minded archival collections. And you can have shared online searching across archival institutions with like-minded collections. And not easy to do when you get a room full of people who have very different ideas and cataloging and stuff, but that's where collection space and lyricists comes into play. We have people on staff to help you with that type of stuff, with configuring it. So um, my last slide, I wanna mention that if you're interested in talking about building a consortium using collection space, I would be happy to speak with you. I left some swag back there. We're not the only game in town, certainly, but we certainly are, are one of the top games in town and we would love to help you with um, creating a consortia of, you know, even two is enough to get started. And then you bring in like three or four additional ones. And then all of a sudden you have a group of people sharing information together. So thank you very much. So we're gonna switch out one more time, or we've got two more, um, but we're gonna switch out again really quickly. And next up is Jennifer West with From Old School to Digital, Making Paper Inventories Discoverable. And I would say Jennifer is also one of our posters. Um, so if you're interested, please stop by. The posters are on the mezzanine in the Morgan Center. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, when you're ready. Good afternoon, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Jennifer West. I'm the Technical Services Lead Librarian at Savannah State University. Now you may realize that has nothing in my title related to archives, but I inherited responsibility to the archives when I started at Savannah State in 2019. Um, and so in addition to um, learning of 
about the school's culture and um, the university system of Georgia culture, I had to learn about my, our special collections. So the Savannah State Special Collections um, describe the history of the oldest public HBCU in Georgia. Um, Savannah State was founded as a Georgia State Industrial College for Colored Youth in 1890. The archives were not created until 1990 for the centennial. Um, some collections have been digitized uh, thanks to the help of lyricists. Um, but our physical collection is lacking organization and description. So what <clears throat> I've discovered is that over 32 years, we've had a lot of uh, knowledge loss as people come and go. Um, we've also had digital document loss, and this comes into play um, in a little bit uh, pretty specifically. In 2020, our uh, library assistant that was in, um, also the archival assistant retired after about 10 years, leaving me as the only staff member in our library um, with any archival experience. I already wear a lot of hats at the library. I really relied on Ms. Ogden to help me um, with you know, helping researchers. She knew the collection backwards and forwards. I didn't. So in the months before her retirement, I spent a lot of time going through the physical collection with her. And another problem that we have is there's no dedicated budget for the special collections. We have the library budget and whatever we're able to carve out of that, we can apply to the special collections. But that's becoming harder and harder as we face budget cuts every year. So the inventory issue is a little hard to see, but this is the best description of our collections that I have. Um, it gives you the location of the box. It gives you a description of the box like diplomas and degrees, and it might give you dates. Only a handful of our collections have finding dates. So I realized I had a lot of work ahead of me to even understand what was in my collection. I did discover that we had some uh, folder level inventories for some of the collections. The problem, they only existed on paper at this point. There was only one copy in the box. So, and even then, it, this is a horrible scan, but there's lots of handwriting on it because this was very out of date by the time I opened it up to compare the inventory. And I'm not even the first person that added um, handwriting to it, so. <clears throat> How do you um, update collection description with very little funding, very little staff? And why would I want to do that? Well, how do I advocate for my special collections if I can't even be clear about what is in the special collections? Um, I think that this is a, you know, we have uh, an asset for our students and our faculty that is being underutilized because people just aren't aware of what is even in it. So it takes, a lot of collaboration with faculty to get students interested. And again, wearing many hats. So fortunately, my, my love is archives. So I just try as much time as I can. So last spring, I was able to hire one student worker that would be dedicated to special collections projects. And I focused on having her move data from physical forms into Microsoft Excel, because we don't have an archives management system yet. It's a goal, um, but at least if I have it in Excel, I can manipulate that data in lots of different ways. Um, I had her focus on what I considered the low hanging fruit, things like our yearbook collection, 
our student newspapers, things that had metadata that was easy to grasp for a, an undergraduate student out of uh, the School of Business. You know, she was very detail oriented, which is why I hired her. She did not necessarily have the passion for history. So, um, and we used uh, Microsoft SharePoint as a way to um, keep updated files. And I see how she had done on a day and where she was and different things and see if I needed to clarify my instructions. So the results were that in one semester, I now have an Excel full of data about our yearbooks, the student newspaper, Tiger Tour, the bulletins, which were both catalogs and annual alumni bulletins, summer school bulletins published for several decades, and the faculty research um, bulletin, which was published for about two uh, decades that included articles um, by faculty. Uh, she also helped me go through our special collections book collection and try to make some sense of that. So the main takeaways, working with an undergraduate student without any archival experience, the design of my Excel files was really important. I needed to be very descriptive in what I expected in each column. And so I would put notes there because as much as I could tell her, I wanted to make sure she had clear examples because these projects take several weeks to go through one collection with the number of hours that she was working. What I have now, I feel, are like these raw materials, but I need time to make them into discovery tools. I can't just take what has been created and throw it up on the internet and expect it to be useful. So there's still some steps to take, but at least I have the information in a digital form. Um, Unfortunately, our student worker budget was eliminated this semester, so this work is not continuing at the moment. But I'm hoping that I can um, apply for some mini grants to get some more student workers in. And then ultimately, I want to work with the history faculty, and we also have a museum administration graduate certificate that's relatively new at Savannah State. And I think it's an opportunity um, for students that are more interested in the subject matter um, to get involved in a hands-on way. And then finally, starting an overwhelming project builds momentum. Yeah, I sat on what to do about my organizational issues for two years. Granted, there was a pandemic in there, but um, I finally, just kind of jumped in with the idea of, okay, I can get some help. What kind of projects can I create for her to do? And now I have some momentum, some direction, and you now it, it may take several more years, but um, the goal is to have a, a well-described collection that can be useful for our students, our faculty, our community, alumni, anybody interested in this history of fantasy. Thank you very much. So again, to all of our presenters, they were all fantastic. Um, and it is really hard to do anything in seven minutes, especially when it's a presentation. So well done. Um, well, that is it for today. So we will hopefully see all of you in the reception in a couple, in about an hour. Okay, thanks, Amber. So Mosaic is sort of on campus. Let me hit let me hit a button real quick. Mm -hmm. <laughs>